Well, good afternoon, brothers and sisters. I pray that the Lord will give me power to edify you this afternoon. The text is John 17, verses 2 to 3. I'll read those verses in just a moment. In reflecting on our theme for this renewal, what is Jesus doing now? There are three, I think, three pillars, three truths that hold up this particular theme. First of all, this, this theme presupposes a living Christ. It, it seems like it goes without saying, but a, a living Jesus is the only kind of Jesus who can be doing anything now. A dead Jesus could not be working in us now. And when we affirm that Christ is alive, we are in fact saying that He has risen from the dead bodily. When we say that Jesus is alive, we're not saying that He is alive spiritually or that He is alive in our hearts or something like that. We're saying that, in fact, the body that was crucified and laid in the tomb is also the body that was raised and, and He was glorified. Amen. So we, we, when we talk about Jesus today, we're, we're talking about a glorified man. Uh, he, is, he is still a man. He's a glorified man, but he's still a man. And he's in heaven where we're going. And that's the only reason we can go there is because he's already there. So this, this theme presupposes a living, resurrected Christ. Secondly, this theme provides the agenda for the church. And what I mean is this. Whatever Jesus is doing... To some degree, we have to be involved in it. I could even go farther and say that whatever Jesus is doing, we ought to be doing too in our own measure. And thirdly, this theme will prove our involvement with Christ. In other words, if Jesus is here, it ought to be evident that he is. Is it not true that when Satan is somewhere, it's evident? The works of the devil are, are usually pretty obvious to those who have eyes to see. And in the same way, the works of Christ will be obvious. So if the, Lord, if the Lord is working in us and through us, and if the Lord is working among us, then that will become evident that we're operating according to His agenda. So those are, those are some things that I think undergird this theme. We have a living Christ... The church is to follow His agenda. We're not free to make our own. And if we're involved with Him, that's going to be abundantly clear. My text is John 17, verses 2 and 3. And I think you will see in this passage that it is very clear what Jesus is doing now. I'm going to also read verse 1. John 17, I'll start with verse 1. Jesus spoke these things, and lifting up His eyes to heaven, He said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Now here's the assigned text, beginning in verse 2. Even as you gave Him authority over all flesh, that's, that's everyone in the world, that to all whom you have given Him, that's all believers, He may give eternal life. Now He's going to define it. What, what is eternal life anyway? Verse 3. This is eternal life, that they, the ones whom God gave to Jesus, may know you, that's God the Father, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. My text, and top, my topic rather, is that he is giving eternal life, even now. He is giving eternal life. Whenever we look at a text, we should consider its context. Jesus was spending his last moments with his disciples here in John 17. Really, the context of the passage goes all the way back to chapter 13. These are the last moments that Jesus had on earth with, with his 12 apostles, or his closest, his closest followers were there. So this is a very intimate time. Jesus is not spending this time with the crowds. He is spending this time with his closest followers. You understand, of course, that there are some things you can learn about Jesus only when you're a disciple. Amen. 
So Jesus is spending his last moments with the disciples. This was the time when he, he took a towel and he girded himself and he washed their feet and showed them the full extent of his love. And he instituted the Lord's Supper at this point. This is a very intimate and precious time. Jesus wanted them at this point to know what was on his heart. He's telling them things in this context that he hadn't really told them before. And in fact, they didn't even understand it. But he told them anyway. And he told them, you, you, won't, you don't understand this now, but you will. Yeah. You'll understand later. There are some things like that in, in the Christian life, isn't there? Yeah. That we don't understand when we hear it, but later we, we understand. Yeah. He wanted also to comfort them. They were disturbed by the thought that he was leaving them. He, he told them, I'm, I'm getting ready to depart. I'm going to go back to the Father. I came from the Father. He said, I'm going back to the Father. I'm not going to be with you anymore physically. And of course, as you can imagine, they were, they were upset about that. That distressed them. They didn't really fully understand why he had to leave. But he did have to leave. He had come into the world to accomplish a specific mission. And he was about to accomplish that mission and then return to the Father. And it had to be that way. Jesus never came in the flesh to remain here in the flesh. Amen. The Jews thought that when the Christ came, he would establish some kind of physical earthly kingdom. They misunderstood the nature of the kingdom of God. I think that was part of their problem here, why they didn't understand what Jesus was doing. But he had to, he had to tell them that he was going away. He was preparing them for his departure but his departure would not be the end of his ministry. 